Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the Forest Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, those that are here in person and also those watching us online, and a special welcome to those that are visiting us. Um, If you're looking for a new church family, uh, please consider us as a possibility for your new church family. Um, All right, so uh, today we have potluck. So that'll be downstairs after church service. Um, We have community cleanup tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. at the Broadway QFC. Uh, For any questions on that, see Kent Caldwell. Uh, there is a flyer on the best time of the day fa- is family worship time challenge. And then we have a fundraiser tomorrow from 4 to 6 p.m. at the church school across the parking lot. Uh, come and join us in the school gym for an evening of fun, games, fellowship, and delicious food. Um, and then we also have a transfer in. All right, please forgive me if I slaughter your, your names. Uh, Pedro, Carla, Kaylian, Sebastian, uh, the Pagan family from the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Puerto Rico to our church. Uh, All, first, uh, second, all those in favor, say amen. amen. All right, all right, and let's see. Oh, yes. So next week's past speaker is Pastor Bill Roberts. Let me just read a little bit on him. So Pastor Bill Roberts from the Washington Conference office will be joining us to lead out in communion next week. Bill is the Washington Conference Ministerial Director, where he serves as the pastor's pastor with ministry coaching and encouragement. He is also the Washington Conference Men's Ministry Coordinator, where he hosts an annual Men's Day in February and encourages local men's ministry activities throughout the year. So uh, if you're uh, wondering what's going to happen next week, that's what's happening next week. All right. Uh, So we have some other further announcements. Lori. As you may have noticed, we do not have a pastor right now, which is why we get to have Anne this morning and Pastor Bill Roberts next week. But um, some people have mentioned that maybe it would be fun to do a few things to help continue to build our family during this time. So the board, we've we've been trying to find a date for a, a while now. But mark your calendars, it's not in your bulletin yet. On Saturday evening, Sabbath evening, uh, November 4, so it's about three weeks from now, three weeks from now, we will be having a church social with some ice cream and some popcorn and some games. And of course, there's volleyball across the parking lot, also in the gymnasium. So there's something for everyone. Um, and we might even be able to make some homemade ice cream if we can get some people to show up and turn the crank because this is not an electric operation. So anyway, bring your favorite board game, um, bring your, your tennis shoes for volleyball, bring some popcorn, well, well, we'll provide popcorn and ice cream and if you have another snack that you cannot survive Sabbath evening without, bring that as well. We will have um, now announcements uh, with details and time in the bulletin, probably beginning next week. And Kathy will email as well. So see you guys then. Good morning. Um, I'm one of the women's ministry leaders, coordinators, and I know I gave everybody a super short notice last week. And so I found out that doesn't really work that well, and I'm trying to do better in the future. Um, I have a little bit of a challenge trying to figure out who can come at which different times, because if I do something in the morning, there's a lot of people who can't come or in the afternoon. So um, you could email me and let me know when your best time is, and maybe I could get more people to come to something um, at a time that is better for different groups of people. 
Um, also in the coat closet part of the church, there's a lot of water bottles lined up there that have been left at the church, and there's some small coats and other things out there. They'll be out there today, and you can go out there and look and see if you find yours, and then they'll be put into the lost and found. Just want to let you know. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to church. I just have um, the desire to ask all of you to really tune in to the music today because our church service is going to actually be focused on music and how we use that in worship. You know, it's really easy to sing familiar songs and just, you know, sing the words and, you know, really not pay any attention to them. And you've sung all the songs and don't know what you sang. At least I've certainly done that a number of times myself. I'm uh, very guilty. Um, and then new songs, well, you may not know them and you may just, you know, let them go by and not even pay any attention. So I think... Um, I'd like you to realize that all of the music today is actually selected for a reason and to fit together with our worship service and to draw us closer to God. We are worshiping the great God in heaven and I would like our music to pull us even closer to him as we uh, gather here together today. So try to listen actively, gain the maximum from this day of worship and I would like you to think of music as a powerful tool, not only in worship, but also in all of our lives. It has a lot of power. It has a deep emotional impact on us. So we can all participate, whether or not we are musical or not, by listening, singing along, leading out, playing an instrument, just um, being involved. It's time now for our call to worship. We'll ask that, hello? <laughs> if everyone could please join us and stand and sing together.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we thank you for the chance to witness one of your amazing astronomical feet, uh, feats today of an eclipse. We ask for your blessing upon this service, upon our lives, and that we may go forth from this service to glorify you and worship you always throughout the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue our song service with um, the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And um, we will sing, be singing three verses. At the end of the chorus on the third verse, there's a very small key change. Sorry, I forgot to tell you about the previous one. And we'll sing the chorus again. Yeah. 
The next song is Great is the Lord. sing our last song, um, just give you a little bit of history, the story behind the song. Eddie Espinosa is the, is the composer, and he tells this story. The year was 1982. I had been a Christian since 1969, but I saw a lot of things in my life that needed to be discarded. I had slowly become very complacent. I acknowledged my complacency, and I prayed to the Lord the only way that I can follow you is for you to change my appetite, the things that draw me away. You must change my heart. Shortly thereafter, I was in my car on my way to work, feeling a desire to draw near to God and with the wrestling still going on in my heart. Suddenly, a melody and some words began to flood through my mind. As I stopped at a stop sign, I reached for something to write on. The first thing I found was a small piece of yellow paper, which, by the way, I still have, and began to write as rapidly as I could. It was like taking dictation. I wrote the words on the paper and kept the melody in my mind. These are the words. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. When we were in the Holy Land, we got to watch a potter working in a traditional pottery as if um, it would have been during the time of Jesus. And it makes so much more sense about the molding with just the tiniest movement of the hand. It changes the whole direction of that pot. Now you know, it, it makes this, this song more meaningful.
deacons and deaconesses, please come forward. Today's offering is Washington Conference Evangelism. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of water. The evangelism offering goes for spreading the three angels' message, supporting evangelistic series, discipleship programs, church plants, and personal witness training. This results in over 700 people being baptized each year. The evangelism offering is one way we can respond bond to Jesus great commission given in Matthew 28:18 through 20 go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit please please bow your heads for prayer dear heavenly father we ask that you bless this offering that we are about to partake in and please use this offering to bring more people into a loving, caring, worshipful relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Psalms 100, verses 1 through 5. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning, church. It is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His compassions fail us not. They are new each morning. Great is his faithfulness. And that's in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. For those who can kneel, can we kneel as we prepare for prayer? <laughs> Precious Jesus, great is thy faithfulness, Lord. And Father, we just thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for bringing us to your home, Lord, the house of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to do that. Father, this world is in such a confused state now. And Lord, we see it on the news. And Father, we just ask him for your Holy Spirit to fall fresh on us, Jesus. To fall fresh on this world, Lord, because we desperately need you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for keeping our family safe, Jesus. We thank you for providing and for your protection, Lord, because we know without you we would be consumed. Great is your faithfulness, Father, that we can depend on you, Jesus. You're the only sure thing that we have and Father, we are so thankful, and we want to give you praise today just for being who you are. Thank you, Lord, that we have someone that we can depend on that cares about everything about us, Jesus. You are an awesome Savior, and we are so thankful, Lord, that we have you. We ask you, Lord, to make us like you, to create in us clean hearts, Lord, change us, Lord, do for us, Jesus, what we cannot do for ourselves. You are our Savior. We cannot save ourselves. Lord, but we're here because we desire you, Lord. We want to spend eternity with you. Lord, continue to pour into this church. Lord, help us be a light for you, Jesus, to draw people to you, Lord. But Lord, keep our hearts where it's supposed to be, Lord. Help us, Jesus, for we need you, Lord. Lord, as we go through this Sabbath. We just ask you, Lord, to keep our minds on you, Jesus, and help it be what it's supposed to be. And Lord, we ask you for the speakers today, Lord, that their words are yours, Jesus. We just ask, Lord, that you just draw each of us near to you, God, for we need you. We thank you for what you've done for each of us this week, and it's all been different from all of us, Lord, but we know that you've been present, and we thank you for who you are, Father. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness, God. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.
It's time for the children's story. All the kids, come up front. Right, we've got a great bunch of kids here today. That's great. Well, I want to tell you a story about when I was a small girl. My uncle Sterling was a pianist, and he was a teacher at the college in Walla Walla. He taught piano, and he was he was kind of a slightly roly-poly gentleman. He always wear, wore a suit. He had gold in his teeth and he had his hair trimmed really short, and he loved kids. And he was a wonderful pianist. He practiced a lot, and he even had a keyboard, and that was something unusual in those days, but that keyboard was silent. It never made any noise, but he could practice all the time and keep his fingers nimble, and he was always talking about keeping his fingers nimble because he practiced many hours a day. And so he would take that silent keyboard with him on trips, and if he was on the trip, well, then he didn't have a piano, but he had his keyboard and he could practice. Well, he was excited to teach me to play the piano. Now, I was only four years old, how many of you are four? Is anybody here four? Nobody's four? Well, okay. I was four, and he wanted to teach me how to play the piano. Well, every Friday, he would come over to our house after he was all done teaching at the college, and he would teach me how to play the piano. And my mom would sit there right beside me, and she would watch to see what I was supposed to learn, and she would then sit with me all during the week, every day when we practiced for half an hour, every day. And um, then Uncle would come back. And every time Uncle came over and he gave me a lesson, then after that, Mom would cut his hair just a little bit shorter. And uh, his hair was always nicely trimmed every Friday. Well, we made flashcards so that I could learn all the notes and all the scales and all the different things you have to do about music. And I practiced, um, and I had to hold my hands just right. He was very particular about that. My wrist, my hand, I had to touch the keys just right so that it would play just nicely. And after a while, he taught me, you know, different songs, and he had me start playing the hymns. The first hymn that he taught me was, My Jesus, I Love Thee. We don't sing that very often, but it was kind of an easier hymn. And a few months after I started taking lessons, it was time for a recital. Have you ever been in a recital? Everybody? Anybody been in a recital? All right. Well... A recital is where you play a piece and you play for the audience. And all the students in Uncle's various music lessons were going to be in this recital. But I was the very youngest one. And so, guess what? I was going to be first. Well, 
I had to like figure out what to do, right? So I practiced a lot. I practiced with uncle. He was going to actually play with me, so that was good. And we were going to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Have you ever heard that song? Yeah, I bet some of you have played that song. Well, we even went to the place where the recital was going to be. It was a big room, and there were a lot of steps up onto the platform. See here, there are just those three steps, but there were like seven or eight steps up there on each side, and it went up there, and there were two pianos. And so Mama and I and Uncle Sterling, we went to that room ahead of time, and we practiced. Me going up the steps, getting on the piano bench, Uncle Sterling playing with me, getting off the piano bench, and then when I was all done playing the song, I was supposed to curtsy. Do you know what that is? That's where you go like that, okay? It's kind of like a bow. You know, the boys bow, right, after they do things like that? Well, the girls were supposed to curtsy. Well, that was all fine. It was getting time for the, the time to have the, um, the, uh, the performance, and Mom got me all dressed up. She'd made me a special dress out of dotted navy Swiss material. It was a big full skirt, big bow in the back, puffy sleeves, you know, white, sh white socks and shiny shoes, right? That's what you wear. Okay, so I was all ready. I was first. I went up there. I got on the piano bench, and Uncle and I played Twinkle, twinkle, little star. And then I started to slide off the bench, and everybody started to clap. It scared me out of my wits. I, I, we didn't practice clapping. Uh, and so it really scared me. So I got off the bench. I knew I had to do the curtsy, but it, I was so scared. I didn't turn around and face the audience. No, I just turned around and went this way, you know? And... <laughs> Then, guess what? They clapped even louder. It, that really scared me. And so I got off that platform and I ran down. Mom was on the front row and I dove into her side and I hid my face and my body as much as I could in her coat and under her arm. And I stayed there for a long time. I didn't even want to peek out. I was so embarrassed. I was embarrassed so much. Well, if you ever have a chance to practice music and take lessons to sing or to play an instrument or play the bells here at the school or, you know, do anything in the line of music, practice hard because it's kind of boring to practice, but eventually it's worth it. You can go back to your seats. Straight, but 
No, 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 this isn't it. Oh, there. That's, that's fine. Okay. Good morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Can you turn me on, please? Is that better? Okay. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh, I don't want to double do it here. Are we okay? All right. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that we can gather here together. Please bless me as I speak. You know, this isn't my usual thing to do. And be with each person here that has gathered here to seek you and to pay attention to things from above for a little bit. Thank you so much for this, this uh, opportunity to have life and health and be with those around the world who are suffering, especially in war-torn areas. In your name, amen. I have always loved music. When I was a child, we often played music. Uh, we had an old phonograph, and we had those old-fashioned records, you know, the old-fashioned things. 
Uh, we had classical music, music from old time Adventists uh, like Del Delker, Sonny Lou, the King's Heralds, Voice of Prophecy, Quartet, the Quartet from Faith for Today, things that probably none of you, or at least not very many of you even heard of, it, let alone remember. But we played that music a lot uh, all through the week. We didn't just play uh, it on Friday night or that type of thing. We played music all the time. My folks taught us from the time we were little kids to take care of the records carefully, try not to scratch them, put them carefully on the phonograph, you know, put the little um, uh, thing that uh, went around and round and um, started up, and we just really loved that. Well, my dad loved music too. Uh, my mom played the piano not too well, but she played, and um, dad played by ear primarily, although he had grown up playing with his father and others in his family. Uh, he played guitar, mandolin. He could read the, the symbols for the guitar chords. Um, and he could read the piano notes some, but not too much. And he also liked to sit at the piano and pick out tunes and play by ear, uh, add the chords in and all of that. Eventually he got a flute, and he loved that flute. Uh, he could take it around, it was pretty portable, and uh, he could uh, play it here and there. Uh, I remember an outing down to the Columbia River uh, we lived in Walla Walla, so we went different places on Sabbath and would, uh, you know, spend the day or go for a weekend. Um, I remember it was a pretty dreary, blustery kind of drizzly kind of day. We had a smoky fire, and uh, he sat on a log uh, that evening with an old army blanket that we took camping, and he had it draped around his shoulders. I think we actually have a picture of it uh, with playing his flute out there by the Columbia River in the, the drizzle. We usually sang and played on uh, Friday evenings. Uh, my three younger brothers and I, as we uh, got old enough, we would play different instruments or sing. My mom would play the piano, and Dad would uh, play you know, whichever instrument he thought he wanted to that night, guitar, mandolin, flute, or whatever, and um, played all sorts of religious music of the day. And then often on Saturday night, well, he wanted to play more music, um, you know, non-religious music, and he had an old book of many old uh, favorites from early America, Home on the Range, Swanee River, Grandfather's Clock, O oh, Susanna, The Old Oaken Bucket, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, Clementine, you can re remember all those great old songs, and uh, lots of other favorites, and uh, so I tried to um, accompany him, and uh, we would play together. Well, one time uh, we were at the grocery store and there were some small records on sale, those little, I think, seven-inch kind. Um, they were kids' records. And I don't know why, but, you know, we didn't have hardly any money. Um, we didn't, you know, buy new music or any of that type of thing. But my mom bought two records for us. And one of them included Johnny Appleseed, but both of those records were... We loved those records. We played them all the time. We, um, they were, we played them loud, and we played them over and over. And they had kind of a beat to them, you know? It was a little different from all the us usual music we listened to. And we would kind of dance around the house and all this kind of stuff. My mother, she had quite a bit of misgivings about that music, but, you know, she bought those records for us, and uh, she didn't take them away. Uh, <laughs> Well, we never listened to the radio, and we didn't own a TV. Uh, my mom wasn't, uh, she didn't think the radio music was much of any good. My dad didn't either, and so we never really did learn the popular music of that day. My father had some health problems, and you know, as a consequence, we moved around a bit. Um, we went from Walla Walla down to uh, south of Portland. We lived right just adjacent to the Oregon Adventist campground, if you've ever been down there. And we went to school there for um, a few years. That was, that was a great experience for me. I don't know about for my brothers, but <laughs> uh, I loved it. Um, it kind of gave me a whole new interpretation of what I should do in school. And then we moved up to Mount Lake Terrace, close to here, and eventually back to Walla Walla. Well, during all that moving around, my musical education was pretty well interrupted. But um, I took up the clarinet when we moved up here, and that was a, a lot of fun for me. I really enjoyed it. 
Um, when I went down to Auburn for a year, I really was uh, inspired by the, the band teacher down there and went to band clinic and ended up being able to be in the band and wind ensemble and woodwind choir over at Walla Walla. It was, it was good times. I love those uh, group music things. But then after I got married, we moved down to Stanford and um, then eventually moved back up here to Mount Lake Terrace. And uh, we looked at all the different churches in the area and found Snohomish Church. In those days, Snohomish Church, it was small, but it was bustling. I think, you know, 100 people crowded into that church every week, and it was just kind of bursting at the uh, seams and uh, a lot of good times and uh, good company and fun things that we did together, uh, picnics and camping and um, church socials and potlucks, you name it. It was a good time. Well, that little church, it had a tiny little organ, small. You know, it just had that many pedals and um, one octave worth. And, um, but I was itching to play that organ. You know, I wasn't in a musical group anymore. There wasn't really much I could, uh, you know, contribute. Um, but I watched the organist and the church pianist play, and I thought, oh, man, I'd love to play that thing. And um, eventually I got my chance. But, oh, I was terrible at that. That was bad. That was terrible. But anyway, um, you know, let's turn our thoughts to music in the Bible. Uh, in the Bible, there was a, there's a mention of much music. Um, the, um, you think about Jericho, how they marched around Jericho once a day for seven days. On the seventh day, they marched around it seven times, and then they blew the trumpets, and what happened? The walls fell out, and they walked in and conquered that city. Uh, you know, that was pretty dramatic. Uh, but there was all kinds of music in the temple. David wrote, wrote many songs for worship. He actually addressed 55 of those songs to the chief musician, specifically for corporate worship, to be sung and played uh, there in the temple. Then, you know, you might remember there was the Song of Miriam, the Song of Mary. Um, Solomon wrote his songs, the love songs, um, the songs of David, you know, are greatly varied. Everything from prayer, supplication, desperate pleas for help. He was afraid for his life. It was terrible times, you know, as he and Saul were, you know, back and forth, and Saul was trying to kill him. There were songs of joy, mourning, and cries to God for forgiveness because David sinned greatly. I mean, he was a man beloved by God, but he uh, also made great mistakes. Think about Revelation. Um, in Revelation 5, it talks about they sang a new song. That's hopefully us singing a new song to Jesus. Revelation 15, they sang the song of Moses. You know, we will remember some of the things that happened here and um, remember all of those things. Well, what, what is the point of um, so much music that we have being drawn from passages of the Bible? I think it draws our attention. It helps us remember those things. I know when we sing songs like what we sang here for song service, you know, it makes me think about what... Um, it, th those songs come to my mind at times when I'm in need or when I, I have either Thanksgiving that I want to raise to God or I, I feel happy or I feel afraid or I feel in need of help. And I think those songs can come in and strengthen us as we uh, put those in our mind because songs sit in our brains in a way that other things do not. The music puts it into our head in a different kind of way and with an emotional impact as well. You know, each generation has its own music. So we come here to church and um, we have people from many cultures, from many different generations, from many different walks of life. How are we supposed to, you know, address music that is good for everybody? Um, you know, some people think the music is too old-fashioned, or that the music is too modern, or that, you know, it's just ancient history, not ap applicable. I remember a time when I was in a church in Tucson, Arizona, 
uh, visiting, at that time I was visiting my stepmother. John and I went to the Adventist church, one of the Adventist churches in Tucson. And I was sitting there, and it was kind of a bigger church, and I was listening to the organist up front playing some prelude music, and she was, um, you know, doing a nice job, and, and I was um, enjoying it and thinking it was really nice. It was, you know, it was kind of classic, you know, not vivacious music. It was kind of, maybe it was a little somber even, I don't know, but I thought it was appropriate. And then I heard this woman, young woman, quite young, uh, right in front of me, whisper loudly to the older lady beside her saying, dreary old dead music. <laughs> it's like, I thought, I was shocked. It made me think that maybe some of the music I was practicing might be perceived like that. I thought, oh no, you know, anything I might play might offend somebody. <laughs> well, our, our um, talk today is about a song in my heart. And our scripture reading, thank you, Tabitha, was from Psalms 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. It doesn't sound dead or anything like that. It sounds pretty, pretty um, active. Whoops, we kind of overdid it there. Also, in, um, wait a minute, maybe I got the wrong one here. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Psalms 33. Um, another psalm of David, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. So let's talk about music. You know, um, music is a powerful thing. It impacts us deeply into our brains, as I said. You remember David... He, um, he played the harp very well. And you recall Saul uh, was the king of Israel, but he hadn't really followed God. And he uh, was afflicted by apparently an evil spirit, and he had fits of anger, depression, jealousy. Um, he even repeatedly tried to kill David, and he hurled his javelin at his own son, Jonathan. But David was employed by the king to try to soothe him with his beautiful harp music. Well, you know, it was kind of a dangerous job, I think, actually. Um, music is used as music therapy these days quite a bit. Uh, there are many people that are actually trained in formal programs as music therapists and um, may be helpful for people who are recovering from various illnesses or suffering from cancer, people who have had strokes, people who are, have dementia. All, many different people can actually benefit from music, and the musical therapists uh, actually try to tailor their music to the people that they are seeing, everything from getting those people involved with either rhythm stuff or playing instruments or singing or maybe just listening, and they use different kinds of music for different kinds of situations. So there's actually quite a bit of science to it. And if you look into, um, start looking around in the literature and in the, you know, wherever you want to look, there, there's quite a bit of information about music as um, an how it impacts us in our brains. They've actually taken uh, musicians and put them in functional MRIs. You know those MRIs that have the big tube that you go in there? Well, they've put them in there with their brain inside, but somehow they were able to, probably they had an open MRI, I don't know. Anyhow, they had them lie inside and, uh, and either improvise music or uh, you know, play or devise music and watch to see which areas of their brain lighted up during all of this. You know, music is not a simple thing. It has structure to it. It has um, a mathematical basis many times. It's architectural. It's based on relationships between notes, uh, both timing as well as the pitch. 
and all of the different things that go to make up any kind of played music sound like it does. You know, the piano versus the clarinet versus the trumpet versus the tuba. They all sound different. All this needs to blend together. And so as musicians are playing, it's a complicated thing. And so when they're, you know, looking at this in an MRI type situation, they can see all these different parts of the brain be very active. You know, it's kind of interesting. Often um, people learn the music of their teen generation, and then that's what they stick with through their life. That's what they like. They don't want to hear anything else. They don't want to hear things from before that, and they don't really want to hear things that are more modern to them. But if you keep listening to those same songs and avoid hearing anything else from other generations, uh, we're probably actually losing out on some things. Um, it turns out that new music, music that you're not familiar with, does actually challenge your brain in a way that old music doesn't. So if you always just stick with the same old music, <laughs> old, it might not um, be as energizing to your brain, and uh, it might not feel pleasurable at first to go outside of your comfort zone, but unfamiliar things that we listen to actually force the brain to struggle to understand the new song or the new sound and make it um, impact us in a new and different way. It is important, I think, to pay attention to the kind of music that you like because music that you like is more beneficial to you in many ways than um, music that really you just can't stand. So, it, music actually does exercise your brain on many different levels. You know, music has been around for a long time. Uh, in 2009, archaeologists excavated a cave in southern Germany, and guess what they found? They found a flute carved from a vulture's wing bone. Now, I don't know how big that vulture was, but carving a flute out of a bone from a vulture sounds pretty delicate. And apparently this thing is quite delicate. Uh, it's the oldest known musical instrument on Earth. You know, music connects people. It connects us. You think about it. Think about singing a national anthem at a sporting event with a huge crowd. You know, it connects people. Or how about a protest march and people, you know, get their songs for that or whatever, or their chants or whatever it might be. Hymns in um, a house of worship build group identity. I mean, it, it's, it brings us together when we sing a hymn. Love songs, you know, they, they bring people together too partners, and lullabies. How about parents and infants? How many mothers and fathers sing to their children? Many people do, and it's, it's a very good thing. So there are many positive benefits to music. Music actually can increase happiness if it's a music that you like. It leads to increased feelings of happiness, excitement, joy, it releases dopamine in your brain, which is a neurotransmitter. This is not advancing for me for some reason. Can you advance the slide, please? Oh, oh now it, it overdid it. Go back. Let's see, maybe, maybe it'll work here. Okay, there. So music can decrease stress. Uh, listening to music that you enjoy can decrease stress. Now, if you listen to dissonant or music that you really don't like, that's not going to work that way. But it may release cortisol, which is a, a stress-relieving hormone in your body. And it can improve sleep. Now, you know, classically, we think of classical or soothing, relaxing type music for going to sleep. You don't want to put on a really, really fast kind of thing if you're trying to go to sleep. And it actually has been shown that if you have trouble with sleeping, putting on some slow music that kind of actually slows down your heartbeat and your breathing as you're in that one hour prior to sleep may actually help you get off to sleep. And 
given that at least 30% of the population have insomnia, you know, it might be something to think about. There might be one or two people here who have trouble with sleep. Wow, this thing is not doing this right. Okay, so music can actually be used to relieve depression. And again, classical or more relaxing type music is better at producing a positive attitude. Uh, technique Techno or heavy metal type music tended to be more of a downer. So if you are prone to depression, think about the music that you do use as potential uh, therapeutic type of thing. See what works better. Because uh, good music, good for you music can actually release other neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, all positive things. Now, what about driving? Uh, you know, there's a lot of trouble on the roads these days. People get angry with each other. There's the whole road rage thing. But it's been shown that music uh, can actually improve driving mood, make driving safer, have, um, you know, less angry feelings, be more calm in the, the difficult traffic things that we're all encountering. And um, so worth a, th worth a thought, you know. Don't play your most angry music while you're driving. Um, music can improve performance in running. So runners who listen to fast or even slow motivational music, but it's got to be, you know, it's got to probably have some beat to it and, you know, can, it can help them run faster. Uh, run, uh, runners who listen to calm music or no music in an 80 meter dash did not do as well as those who ran with, um, I don't know, uh, music with a beat. How about music for weight loss? Well, um, it's one study showed that if you go to a restaurant with kind of uh, soft lighting and um, nice music, that can decrease food consumption. And it may be that it's just that relaxed and whatnot, you eat more slowly, and then maybe your stomach doesn't fill up as fast. And, I mean, it fill, you, f you recognize that it has filled before you've eaten a whole lot that you didn't really need to. And may actually help with weight loss. And, of course, you can enjoy it more. Well, how about learning? We talked about that earlier a little bit, but you know, there's a little diagram of the brain up there and all these different spots that are all uh, associated with many different functions in the brain. And music actually just works to help learning in many deep ways. There's a lot of papers written on it, and we can't go into it now, but um, you know, a little kid playing at the piano um, or any kind of instrument or singing. You know, actually singing is a very powerful form of uh, involvement of the brain. It's very good. So don't discount that. And music actually has been shown to increase verbal intelligence. Not every type of verbal intelligence. They break verbal intelligence to all of these different uh, kinds of lines of thought. But musical training of children had a transfer effect. In other words, if they learned to play music or they were trying to learn to play music, it actually helped them with word comprehension and the ability to explain the meaning of words uh, much better. So looking at kids uh, with and without musical training uh, seemed to have an effect. I mean, it's true. When you look at these studies, it's a little bit hard to say, okay, you know, these people had musical training, these people did not. You know, maybe some chose this and ch didn't choose it because they had, you know, innate skills and um, ability in those areas. You know, can't, it's, it's a hard thing to study, but uh, early learning, musical intelligence and whatnot may actually uh, increase IQ from what they have found. Okay, so how does this all tie into worship? And what does this have to do with anything of real value uh, to us? You know, I think as we think about worship in a church or in any kind of corporate setting, oftentimes music is complex, uh, complexed with reading the word, studying the word, praying to God. So we we sort of weave this all together as a worshipful thing and we find that helpful and i think 
it does help us as we try to put this all together. We don't usually tear it apart and uh, say, okay, well, you know, how is this psychologically helping us? But, you know, it's not probably too bad an idea to at least think about it a little bit. Um, and I just wanted to kind of go from there to the point that the only reason we really come to worship is because we want to come to God. We want to be saved. We want to be in God's kingdom. And that is what's really important here. And if music can help us connect to God, then let's make that connection. Really, I think we often make the whole thing about worship and salvation too complicated. Think about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Look how complicated they made it. You know, you have to do all these things. They have whole huge books written about all the rules about how to keep Sabbath or how to do this or, you know, any number of things. But what did Jesus say? It's a simple thing. You remember the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were always trying to corner Jesus, right? And so after the um, Sadducees had had at him for a while and they were kind of shut down, well, one of the Pharisees said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like in it, like, like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He was summarizing what we need to do quite simply. Love God, love one another. Micah says, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God? In Acts, uh, Paul was over there in Philippi, and he got himself into a lot of trouble with the community. And they beat him and threw him in jail and all of that. And um, then there was that earthquake and the jailer was going to kill himself. Well, Paul said, don't, don't kill yourself. We're here. We're not running away. And uh, so he said, well, what, what do I need to do to be saved? And they said to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their, their injuries, their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Paul didn't make it very difficult for that jailer, did he? Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And in Luke, remember this, this is the classic one, I think, Jesus was hanging on the cross, and one of the criminals there was blaspheming him, blaspheming him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other one, answering, rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus didn't make it very hard for that thief on the cross, did he? That thief hadn't followed God all his life, but he turned to him at the last minute. Now, I don't advise anybody to wait to the last minute and then try to turn to God. But, you know, God is there. He wants us. God so loved the world, this very classic one from John 3, 16 and 17. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We need to believe. Well, I try to incorporate worship and music into my life as much as I can. I'm somewhat busy. Um, I, in the morning as I get up and 
do all the things I need to do to get ready to go to work. I try to listen to Bible from um, one of my Bible apps. And there are a couple that are easy to um, use. There's Bible Gateway and Bible. They're both free. You can just put it on your phone. You can listen. You can read. You can get all different kinds of translations read to you. Uh, some of them have music or you know um, things that go with it. I find them very interesting and, and engaging, and I cover a lot of territory, and I find it just really comes into my heart that way in a way that, uh, I mean, I, I, as I listen to it, you know, a time and again, well, I can go through the Bible and remember these things, and it, it's really useful, I think. On the way to work, um, I have some songs that I like to sing. Now, I don't sing in public. Uh, I mean, I sing in the group. I don't sing up here on, at the microphone, but um, I like to sing for myself and as a worship and a prayer to God. And I think that it's useful to me. Now, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just giving you a few ideas about way to, to more incorporate these things into your own lives and to increase your um, ways of worshiping him. We all are very busy. And, you know, it says in the Bible, you know, put the words of God on your doorposts and everywhere. Well, you know, I don't think we need to literally do that. But if we put them in our hearts, that's what's important. And any way we can put them in there, it's all the better. And on my way to work, um, I pray for my patients of the day, anybody I'm going to operate on, uh, others that I'm going to touch on labor and delivery or whatever it is. You know, I, I want God's help with all those things, and I pray for that. And I pray for John, my family, my church. So, how are we going to choose what music we're going to watch or listen to or be involved with or play? I think it all goes back to Philippians 4.8. To me, this is a hugely important verse. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Finally, my prayer for you and for myself Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. This is a favorite song of mine that I like to sing to myself and to God in my car when nobody else can hear me, because I love this song, and it means so much to me. At this time, uh, John will have our, uh, our final special music, and then after that, we will have our closing song. Reach through the 
Please stand, and we're going from a prayerful song to a joyful song, because we have hope, we are singing, We Have This Hope. I want to read Psalms 150 as our closing prayer. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I would just like to remind you, there is potluck downstairs. Don't go home. <laughs>